Well, let's turn together to Revelation chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles on uh, every row, and you can pick one up and follow along. This morning, I'm going to read verses 5 through 8 as we continue our verse-by-verse study of this book. Revelation chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a black horse and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, And Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. This is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, this morning, in your kindness to us, help us to understand this book once again, which has baffled many of us through the years. But as your spirit and the exposition of your word gives us clarity, we are able to live with confidence in you. We pray that would be the case for each of us this day in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you're just joining us, uh, we're studying the book of Revelation. We're going verse by verse through it. We've been in this section, verses uh, chapter 4, 5, and 6, which is this vision that John has uh, in the throne room of heaven. In Revelation chapter 6, what we see here is, is that the Lamb is opening up a scroll, and that scroll is sealed with seven seals. Now, that scroll is a decree of judgment against Israel because Israel rejected the Messiah. That's Jesus. They put him to death. And when Jesus opens this scroll by breaking its seals, what it does is, is it sets in motion the same events that Jesus prophesied about back in Matthew chapter 24. And all of that has to do with God's judgment against Israel by the Roman Empire in which the Roman Empire comes in and destroys Jerusalem and the temple in AD, chapter, in AD 70. Now, what this means is, is that the seven seals, and I've told you this every week, but I want to keep repeating it because this is such a confusing thing for people, the seven seals, and then later the seven trumpets, and then the seven bowls, as I keep telling you, that means these are things that have happened in the past, not things to happen in the future. They happened in the past. The breaking of the first four seals that we see here, they all follow a pattern. Each time a seal is broken, one of the four living creatures who surrounds the throne of God, worshiping him day and night, then summons a rider on a horse with a command to come. And so in verse 2, the first horse comes, it's white. Then in verse 4, the second horse comes, it's a bright red horse. We looked at those two last week. Now in verse 5, Uh, The third horse comes, it's a black horse, and then we get the final horse, a pale horse, in verse 8. Now, these horses, as we saw last week, are similar to what we see in Zechariah chapter 6. And so these horses are set against the backdrop of that Old Testament prophecy. Uh, They represent God's uh, judgment that he's carrying out for his sovereign purposes. Now, last week, we studied the first two horsemen. We saw that the rider on the white horse... If you weren't here and you look at that white horse, he represents uh, the beginning of the Roman war against Israel in the spring of A.D. 67. Even more specifically, that rider on the white horse could represent the Roman general Vespasian. Now we saw that the rider on the red horse uh, comes along next, representing the end of the peace in the land of Israel. And it marks the beginning of a Jewish civil war. That civil war lasts right up until the moment uh, that Jerusalem is devastated by the Romans. So now we turn our attention to this third and fourth seal, and to the black and the pale horse, and we start in verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse. And its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. When you hear scales, these are like scales that you weigh something, not like he was scaly like a fish or something. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, 
and do not harm the oil and the wine. So this third horse is black, and he symbolizes famine. And we see this from the description of its rider, which verse 5 says, has this pair of scales in his hand. So these scales represent the necessity of weighing out food during a time of famine. This food is being rationed, and this is due to the fact that the famine has resulted in inflation, an in increased cost of food. So there's an economic crisis due to the rising cost of food. So just like you would think of in any war that exists in countries where uh, you and I, as I said before, we're accustomed to living in this time where we can just go to Costco and we can buy whatever we want and however much quantity we want. But that's not the case in times of war. There's a ration that takes place. Now verse 6 says, I heard what seemed to be a voice. So he hears a voice and notice where the voice is. It's in the midst of the four living creatures. So this voice doesn't belong to the living creatures. That voice that belongs to the living creatures continually summons the riders to come, but not this voice. Remember, these living creatures are surrounding the throne. So that means that this voice, which is in the midst of the living creatures, is coming from the throne or the area next to the throne, which would be either the voice belonging to God or to the Lamb. The Lamb is next to the throne. So either God or the Lamb, that's Christ, says in verse 6, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius. So this famine has resulted then in this inflation and this economic hardship because a denarius was the equivalent of a day's pay for a day laborer. So you worked one day, you received one denarius. So a quart of wheat for a denarius was about eight times the normal cost of a quart of wheat. So that's pretty high. And then uh, this uh, three quarts of barley for a denarius, that's about 16 times the normal cost of this. So you've got eight times the cost of wheat, 16 times the cost of barley, and barley wasn't even that good. It was kind of the less nutritious thing. Uh, and so this is a, a very bad situation that these people will now find themselves in. Now, as we studied in Revelation 4 and 5, we saw that Ezekiel 1 and 2, and that vision serve as the backdrop of John's vision. Now, both Ezekiel and John see this uh, in their respective visions, this scroll decreeing judgment against Israel. Now, in Ezekiel, all right, the nature of that judgment is revealed in the prophecy that comes in Ezekiel 4 and 5, and all of that prophecy relates to the siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. And remember, that's going to culminate in the destruction of the first temple that was built by Solomon. That's going to happen in 586 B.C. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 4, the siege of Jerusalem results in a famine, just like here. And it is symbolized in some very bizarre and dramatic ways. And I say bizarre because we've been reading uh, Ezekiel together in our Bible reading as a church. And I'm sure that I'm not the only one who's standing in my kitchen at 5 o'clock in the morning saying, this is weird, all right? But it's some strange symbolism that's taking place, right? Well, the chapter, Ezekiel chapter 4, ends with these words. Let me read these to you. We don't have time to turn, but you can mark Ezekiel 4, 16 and 17. Here's what it says. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, behold, I will break the supply of bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight. They're going to have to weigh it in scales. And with anxiety. And they shall drink water by measure and in dismay. And I will do this that they may lack bread and water. And look at one another in dismay and rot away because of their punishment. And then in the very next chapter, in Ezekiel 5, it describes the destruction of Jerusalem, which involves, listen very carefully, famine, wild beasts, sword, and pestilence, which, as we looked at extensively last week, all four of those things are represented in the horsemen of Revelation. And of course, here in Revelation 4 and 5, John sees a scroll decreeing judgment against Israel. And the nature of this judgment is revealed in the seven seals of Revelation 6 and 8. 
and they too relate to the siege of Jerusalem. This time it's by the Romans, and it culminates in the destruction of the second temple, the temple that was rebuilt after that first temple was destroyed. And so just like Ezekiel and the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem over 500 years earlier, now the Roman siege of Jerusalem results in a famine that is once again symbolized by wheat and barley and weighing of food. And so we see the same thing again. Now, the Jewish historian Josephus, who I've told you was an eyewitness to the siege, wrote the following about this famine that took place during the Jewish war. He said this, The madness of the seditious did also increase together with their famine. And both of those miseries were every day inflamed more and more because there was no corn which anywhere appeared publicly. Couldn't find it anywhere. But the robbers came running into, so now we have these thieves, they come running into and they searched men's private houses. And then if they found any corn, they tormented the owner of the corn because they had denied that they had any. And if they found none, they tormented them worse because they supposed they had more carefully concealed it. The indication they made use of, whether they had any or not, so how'd they know if these people, how do they know? They say, I, I think you have it in your line. How'd they know? Here's what they said. The indication was taken from the bodies of those miserable wretches, which if they were in good case, so they looked healthy, they supposed they were in no want of food at all. They said, ah, you look like you have some meat on the bones. We think you're lying to us, in other words. But if they were wasted away, well, then they left them alone. They walked off without searching any farther, farther nor did they think of pro it proper to kill such people as these because they saw that they would soon die themselves for want of food. Many there were, indeed, who sold what they had for one measure, it was of wheat if they were of the richer sort, but of barley if they were poor. When these had so done, they shut themselves up in the inmost rooms of their house and they ate the corn they had gotten. Some did it without grinding it by reason of the extremity of the want they were in and others baked bread of it according as necessity and fear dictated to them. In other words, if they were too afraid to cook it because someone might smell it, they just ate it. A table was nowhere laid for a distinct meal, but they snatched the bread out of the fire half-baked, and they ate it very hastily. He then goes on to describe women stealing food out of the mouths of their infants, and at one point he even writes of a woman watching her infant nurse at her breast and realizing that she was starving taking the infant from her breast and then roasting it over an open fire to eat it. This is the description given of what happens during the time from A.D. 66 to 70 in which this famine occurs in the land. This is why I say over and over again when I refer to these events as the tribulation that most people have reserved for some post-rapture concept and they say, well, but nothing will ever be as bad as this. I don't know what's as bad as women roasting their children over an open fire. I mean, if you're waiting for something worse than that to come, I can't help you. This is as horrible as it gets. Now, the horror of such a thing sounds unthinkable to us. Uh, it, but yet, when we read this, what it does is, is, for the astute Bible reader, it calls to memory the very thing that God said would happen if his people broke the covenant. So I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 28. And as you turn there, let me explain that in Leviticus chapter 26, which we're not turning to, uh, God speaks of a sevenfold punishment for breaking the covenant that he made with Israel, which is certainly not coincidental, I think, in relationship to the seven seals in Revelation. And one of the curses for breaking the covenant in Leviticus 26 was famine. In fact, I'll just read to you what Leviticus 26.26 26 says. It says, When I break your supply of bread, ten women shall break your bread in a single oven and shall dole out your bread again by weight. 
and you shall eat and not be satisfied. So notice there's a weighing of the food. But even more specifically, what I want you to see is, is how specific God is in his threat to Israel in Deuteronomy 28. Look at verse 53. He says, and you shall eat the fruit of your womb, the flesh of your sons and daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege and in the distress with which your enemies shall distress you. What are they going to eat? They're going to eat their own children. Verse 54, the man who is the most tender and refined among you will begrudge food to his brother, to the wife he embraces, and to the last of the children whom he has left. He won't even give his wife or his kids his food. So that he will not give to any of them, any of the flesh of his children whom he is eating, because he has nothing else left. In the siege and in the distress with which your enemy shall distress you in all your towns. The most tender and refined woman among you who would not venture to set the sole of her foot on the ground because she is so delicate and tender will begrudge to the husband she embraces, to her son and to her daughter, her afterbirth that comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears because lacking everything, she will eat them secretly in the siege and in the distress with which your enemy shall distress you in your towns. You can't get any worse than that. That is right out of the book of Deuteronomy. This isn't some uh, hyperbole that someone is trying to describe to say, oh, it's so bad. This is what God has said would happen to them. These covenant curses which came upon Israel in 586 by the hands of the Babylonians were now reaching their ultimate and final fulfillment in the Roman siege of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And to make matters worse, the famine was not simply due to the Roman siege, It's not just that the Romans cut off the supply of food. That would be just the Romans causing this. But on top of all of this, the Jews burned down their own granaries in the city while they were cut off from the supply of food outside the city. Josephus writes about this again. He writes about a man named John of Damascus who was a Jewish insurgent. And listen to what he says. He says, John set on fire those houses that were full of corn and of all other provisions. The same thing was done by Simon, when upon the other's retreat, he attacked the city also. Now they're having a civil war, remember? And now they're burning up their own food. As if they had on purpose done this to serve the Romans by destroying what the city had laid up for food against the siege. And by thus cutting off the nerves of their own power, accordingly it came to pass that all the places that were about the temple were burnt down and were become an intermediate desert space ready for fighting on both sides and that almost all corn was burnt which would have been sufficient for a siege for many years. So they were taken by the means of the famine which it was impossible that they should have been taken by the famine unless they had thus prepared the way for it by this procedure of burning down their own storehouses. Guess what the very next paragraph that Josephus writes about in this section of the Jewish wars. The very next paragraph is the very one that I read to you last week describing the civil war in Israel. You'll remember opening the second seal resulted in the red horse causing a Jewish civil war in the land, which as we now see led to a famine, which was exactly what the third seal, the black horse, caused to take place. So you're beginning to see how these seven seals work together and how they relate to Matthew 24 and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, not some global economy filled with cryptocurrency And, you know, the UN with a one world nation sometime in the future. Before moving on, let me briefly point out at the end of verse 6 that God or the Lamb here gives another command. And he says, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And with this command, we see once again that these events taking place on earth 
are completely controlled by the one who is in heaven. At this point in his judgment, God restrains the judgment in the destruction and the devastation, reminding us that he is in control. Not the Romans, they're not in control. It's the riders on, the, on these horses that belong to him, who are serving his purposes, who are obeying him. They're the ones who are causing the destruction by the hands of the Romans, but they are under the hand of God. And as we'll see in the next seal, his judgment is progressive, and at this point, the oil and the wine are slimply left untouched. So now we come to the fourth seal. It says in verse 7, When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come, and I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. While there are still three more seals to be opened, this is the last time that opening a seal is going to result in one of the four living creatures summoning a horseman to come. This fourth horse is described as pale. Now, that's an interesting word. The word pale translates uh, a Greek word, chloros. It's from that word that we get our English word chlorophyll and chlorine. And so it really describes more of a, a sort of pale greenish gray. Like if you ever poured chlorine out, it's kind of a greenish gray color that's uh, common also in the color of someone who's very sick and dying or a decomposing corpse. Corpse has this sort of uh, pale greenish gray color. And that's appropriate because this horse uh, has a rider whose name is Death. Now this is the only one of the four horsemen who is given a name. And it's also the only one who is not alone. Notice that verse 8 says, Hades followed him. Hades should not be confused with hell. Uh, the New Testament calls hell Gehenna. Rather, uh, in the Bible, Hades and its Hebrew counterpart, Sheol, simply refers to the realm of the dead. So death and Hades are personified here as if they're people. And they are in partnership. So that whatever death does, whenever he goes and strikes down a person, Hades is right there with him to claim that person. Next, verse 8 says, They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. Now, looking at the details of this statement, I want you to pay very careful attention to this phrase. It says in verse 8, and they were given authority. Now, remember what we saw last week when we looked at the second seal that was opened. Look back up at verse 4 in chapter 6. It says, and out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted. That means given permission. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth. So that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. And who was it that gave him permission to take peace from the earth? It was Jesus, the Lamb, who gave him permission. Because as he said to his followers in Matthew 28, on the day that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That word authority is an important word. That word authority is the Greek word exousia. It refers to ruling authority. Ruling authority. In fact, the lexicon defines it as a state of control over something or the right to control or command. It refers to absolute power. Absolute power. This means that Jesus has been given the right to control and command everything in heaven and on earth. All of it. Because he possesses absolute power in on earth and in heaven. Let me say that again. Jesus possesses absolute power. Absolute not in degree, but absolute. There are no challenges to his power, both on earth where we live and in heaven where God dwells. Jesus possesses absolute power and the right to control and command all things in every location in the universe. And you need to know this. You need to know this more than you need to know anything else in your life. 
You need to know that whatever happens in your life, you can say with absolute confidence, I know who is in control. I know who possesses absolute power. No matter what circumstances you face, you need to know who it is that possesses the absolute power to command every event in the universe. You need to know this. What does Revelation 6, 8 say? It says this about death in Hades. They were given authority. That means that death and the grave do not have their own authority. Death and the grave do not have their own authority. Rather, they are under the authority of someone else. Someone who is therefore much more powerful than they are. And who is that someone else? It is the Lamb, the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given. And the context in which Jesus tells his disciples that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him is right after his resurrection from the dead, which means that death and Hades had no power over him and he has the absolute right to control and command them. He does. In fact, look back at Revelation chapter 1 where John is commissioned by Jesus and look again at what he says in Revelation 1. Verses 17 and 18, Jesus there speaks clearly. When I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. And when we looked at this passage, I pointed out that that concept of possessing the keys was a, a symbol of his power and his authority that he has the right as the key holder to open and close to lock and unlock the gates the doors of death in Hades that means that they are completely under his power and his authority let me say that again death and the grave are completely under the power and the authority of Jesus. And you need to know that. You need to know that. This is why Revelation 6, 8 is clear. Death in Hades must be given authority to kill. Because unless Jesus gives them permission, they can't kill. You know why? Because they're locked up under his control. They're under his power. And if locked up, then they are incapable of doing harm. They are not free to do as they choose. This is like some mornings when I am out for a run and I see someone walking with a ferocious dog on a leash. You know what I worry about? Not the dog, but the ability of the one holding the leash to control the dog. See, because the dog can be as strong and mean and terrifying as any animal on earth. But as long as the leash holder can control the dog, then the dog poses no threat. This is what we see in this picture. You want to know who has the greater power? It is Jesus. He holds death on a leash the grave is under his control. And you need to know this. You need to understand that death and Hades do not have free reign upon the earth to claim the life of whoever they feel like, wherever they feel like it. We are so accustomed to living in a fallen world where we understand rightly that the wages of sin are death and therefore people die and people die around us every day and they die all the time and it can seem as if death is just sort of arbitrary. And we think, wow, no one can tame this wild animal. Yes, we live in a fallen world but we do not live in an autonomous world. We don't live in a world in which sword 
and famine and wild beasts and pestilence of the earth go around killing whoever they want, whenever they want. No, no, no. We live in a world in which the authority of Christ exercises absolute power over death and the grave. That's the world we live in. He commands death in all of its little minions, whether it be war and bullets or cancers or heart disease, whether it be automobile accidents, whether it be famines, whether it be wild animals in some sort of crazed, maniacal attack, destroying and chewing someone to pieces. He controls the many minions of death. They do not operate on their own. They do not operate under a power that is inherent and intrinsic within them. No no matter what what might be that death in Hades uh, brings into your life that, that, that seeks to destroy you, Understand that it cannot do so apart from the authority of Jesus. Jesus is the sovereign Lord with absolute power. And you now, you see why you need to know this. You have to know this because you got to know that whatever threatens your life, no matter how terrifying it might be, and maybe it's not your life. Maybe it's the life of, of your children or your parents or someone else, a, a, a husband or a wife, and it, and it frightens you. And you feel as if death in Hades has authority and at any moment they can just take that person you love from you. But they can't. They can't. Because they are under the sovereign authority of Christ. And those who are in Christ, those who have repented of their sins, have turned away from their sins and placed their trust in Christ in his sacrifice where he bore the punishment of their sins on the cross. Those who are in Christ, they don't have to worry any longer about these things because one day when Christ returns, he will take the keys of death and Hades, he will unlock the grave and he will raise them from the dead and they will live forever with him. And that's why the people who are in Christ are not to be the people in this world afraid of dying. We're not to be afraid of the loved ones that we have in our life who, who, who might die from something that's horrible, but they're in Christ. And we can say in that moment, you know, look, 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 their body is in the grave, but they're in Christ. And when Christ returns, he'll raise their body from the grave. They'll be with him forever. Death can't hold them. It can't hold them. You need to know this. You need to know this. If there's going to be any hope for you to live with settled confidence and security and assurance in this world, you have to know who it is that has the authority and the power over death in Hades. It is Christ. So mind-blowing to me. Every single time I listen to someone tell me, I don't know, the book of Revelation, it scares me. I say, my gosh, this book of Revelation emboldens me. This book makes me feel like something is absolutely like in Greek mythology somewhere that I've been given the gift of invincibility. I'm impervious to the fears of this world if this book be true. You need to know who it is that has power and authority over death and the grave so that whatever faces you down You can stare right back into the eyes of it and say, you will not rob me of my joy, my settled peace, and my confidence. You have a master. His name is the sovereign Lord Jesus. If you take my life today, he will give it back to me tomorrow. You need to know this, folks. This is a point I can't overstate. Individually, corporately, we have to reflect on this often. As we come back to this scene in Revelation 6, 8, let's work through these details here. Death in in Hades, they're given authority, it says, over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. And first, we already saw that last week, this is the backdrop, is, is Ezekiel 14. And we don't have time to revisit all that. But there, remember, God describes... Uh, the judgment that he's decreed against Israel. And in Ezekiel 14, he says that he's going to bring about these four things. He says in verse 13, he's going to bring a famine upon the land 
In verse 15, he says he's going to cause wild beasts to pass through the land. Verse 17, he says he's going to bring a sword upon the land. And in verse 19, he's going to bring pestilence into the land. All of that's coming where? Into the land. Into the land. Into the land. Into the land. All that is going to happen in the land of Israel. This is summarized in Ezekiel 14, 21. For thus says the Lord God, how much more when I send upon Jerusalem. Where is it coming to? To the land. To the land. My four disastrous acts of judgment. Sword, famine, wild beast, and pestilence. To do what? To cut off from the, man, the man and the beast from the land. He's going to kill them. They're going to be gone by these four things. So these four disastrous acts of judgment are directly related to where? To the land. To Israel. To Jerusalem. Here in Revelation 6, I want you to notice that death and Hades were given authority over what? A fourth of the earth. To do what? To kill with those same four disastrous acts of judgment. Now last week we saw in Revelation 6-4 that when the second writer was permitted to, notice the language, take peace from the earth, we saw that it was referring to the land of Israel. The word earth is the word gay. And in Greek, and it simply means uh, the surface of the earth, like dirt. It doesn't mean planet earth, but rather land as opposed to sea. And in the context of Revelation, it is typically referring to the land of Israel. So here in verse 8, we have the same context, which means death and Hades were given authority over a fourth of the land of Israel. To do what? To kill. They were given authority to kill. Why they needed that authority? Because Jesus has the authority over them. They don't get to do it without his authority, without his permission. To kill with sword, famine, pestilence, wild beast. In Ezekiel 14, God sent those same four disastrous acts of judgment upon Jerusalem because of Israel's unfaithfulness. And what did it result in? The Babylonians destroying Jerusalem. Well, now, and this is a very important point, This act of judgment, these same four acts of judgment, all right, are not now sent upon the whole earth because the whole earth is not the object of his judgment at this point. Israel is. Why? Because Revelation 1-7, which is the theme verse of the whole book, tells us who the object of his judgment is. And it says, it is those who pierced him. Who pierced him? Well, the Jewish leaders and all those people in the nation who were crying out in Matthew 27, 27, let his blood be on our hands and on our children. So who is the object of his judgment? It is the nation of Israel. So in Revelation 6, God, just like in Ezekiel 14, sends the same four disastrous acts of judgment upon Jerusalem, again, because of Israel's unfaithfulness. And what does it result in? The same thing. The Romans destroying Jerusalem and the temple. And in Ezekiel, these acts of judgment in Revelation 6, uh, they were not sent upon a fourth of the earth as being the whole planet earth. And the reason why is because both in Ezekiel and in Revelation, the whole earth was not the object of his judgment. Israel was because Israel had pierced the Messiah. Not someone else, Israel. So as with the previous seals and horsemen, guess what we find? We find that the opening of the fourth seal is fulfilled in the events of the Jewish war of the first century. Not in the future, in the past. It's right there. The death that occurred as a result of this war was staggering. It was so horrible. And once again, the eyewitness account of Josephus to this war details the horror of what took place. Listen to what Josephus writes. So all hope of escaping, getting out of Jerusalem, was now cut off from the Jews, together with their liberty of going out of the city. Then did the famine, which was the previous seal, widen its progress and devoured the people by whole houses and families Their upper rooms were full of women and children that were dying by famine. And the lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged. The children also and the young men 
wandered about the marketplace like shadows, all swelled with famine, and those children and young men then suddenly just fell down dead wherever their misery seized them. As for burying them, those that were sick themselves were not able to do it. And those that were hardy and well were deterred from doing it. They didn't bury them. And what deterred them? The great multitudes of those dead bodies. There were so many dead bodies, they said, we can't even possibly bury these, all these people. And by the uncertainty that they had as to how soon they might die themselves. For many people died as they were burying others. And many went to their coffins before that fatal hour was come. This horrible description of so many dead bodies due to the sword and the famine and the pestilence that was happening in the city resulted in there being no room to even bury these people. See, they were inside of the city walled in. They couldn't just go out into the countryside and bury people. So where are they going to bury them? Well, so what did they do? Well, Josephus then goes on to record how due to the stench of the bodies piling up in the city from, the, from the, the many, many rotten corpses that just lay everywhere. It was so bad that what they did with those dead bodies is they just tossed them from the city walls down into the valley below. And guess what happened when they were lying in the valley below? The wild beasts ate them. Sword, famine, pestilence, wild beasts. And remember at this point, death and Hades are only given authority over a fourth of the land, which means there is more to come. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, 8, all this is but the beginning of the birth pains. Here, it's a fourth of the land. In Revelation 6, it will be a third. I mean, Revelation 8. And then in Revelation 16, it's going to be everything. So you see how these four horsemen fit together and how what's happening is stacking in intensity upon one another. There's an intensity that is building. Hopefully by now, I hope Revelation is beginning to make a bit more sense to you as you see it in light of the historical context. I hope as it's doing that, it's making you, one, less frightened of the book, and two, just less frightened in general to be alive in the world. I hope it's reminding you every single chapter who it is that is in charge. It's Jesus. Now, we've looked at these four horsemen, and they've wreaked havoc upon the earth. Next week, we're going to turn our attention into what's happening in heaven, and that's going to be in relationship to the fifth seal, You'll notice that the fifth seal is going to speak about what's happened to those who have died and are in heaven awaiting the vindication of their lives for their faithfulness to Christ. So we'll look at these martyrs and then we'll come to the fifth seal, I mean the sixth seal, which will uh, finish up the chapter with the devastating effects that take place in the land. And that will give way to the 144,000 in chapter 7, which Lord willing will cover all in one fail swoop together. All right? Let's pray together as we close. Lord, this day we are grateful for your presence in our lives. We are thankful for the promise that Christ reigns supreme with absolute power and absolute authority over the grave. Death has been robbed of its power and defeated in the victory of Christ's resurrection. And as people, we stand secure in him. I pray you would strengthen our weary hearts this day to have confidence in his goodness. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.